Hello and welcome to this course on labor and decent work in supply chains. The most distinctive feature of the global economy in recent years has been its increased globalization. Thanks to the development of various technologies, the production of goods and the provision of services are not contained within national boundaries. Along with goods and capital that move easily across international borders, there has also been a great increase in the migration of people. This course is about the aspirations of these people who work in these globalized supply chains. Here you will learn about the instruments of law, including some that are often understood to be part of something called soft law, that will give them access to productive and suitably remunerated work, safety at the workplace, social protection for their families, better prospects for personal development and social integration, the freedom for individual workers to set out their claims, to organize and to participate in decisions that affect their lives, and the equality of opportunity and treatment for all. To start this course, we must get a good understanding of the role that law plays in decent work. One of the ways we can do this is through the lens of history. Let us take a look at some of the events and shifts that happened at the turn of the 19th century. The Industrial Revolution, through the introduction of machines, transformed the processes of production. When production shifted from small-scale production studios to large-scale factories, it also transformed our relationship with work. For many years, employment relationships were governed only by the contract between the employer and the employee. Politically, the attitude of laissez-faire, which meant that the state would not intervene in the free will of the parties to enter into contracts, was dominant. The theory was that parties, that is, the employer and the employee in the case of an employment relationship, decided freely whether or not to conclude a contract, the terms of that contract, and also when to terminate that contract. The first major shift happened in relation to the employment of children. Following the widespread public opinion in England against the use of children in dangerous conditions in factories, the Parliament prohibited the labour of children under 9 years of age, limited the working hours of older children to 12 a day, and abolished work at night. The Parliament also required the provision of a basic level of education for all apprentices, as well as adequate sleeping accommodation and clothing. By 1833, the Parliament also empowered independent inspectors to enforce the law and in 1847, the working hours of women and children in British factories was further reduced to 10 hours a day. From the mid-19th century, the Parliament tried to improve the conditions of the workforce in general. The systematic reporting of fatal accidents was made compulsory and basic safeguards for health and safety, especially in mines and in relation to boilers, was put in place. By the end of the century, nearly all European nations had a comprehensive set of regulations that affected work in nearly all industries. In India, however, there was an additional factor that led to the growth of law that provided for the welfare of workers, and that was British colonialism. Protecting British industry from competition from Indian firms was an important consideration for the British Parliament, which often set even higher standards for Indian firms to meet. The Factories Act, first introduced in 1883, stipulated overtime wages beyond eight hours of work, abolished child labor, and restricted women from being employed at night. The development around the world of law aimed at improving the conditions of the workforce was accelerated by the increased organization of workers into groups known as trade unions. Such groups that bargain with employers on behalf of a collective of workers had been around for several centuries but were outlawed in England until 1872. Their prominence, however, increased 
considerably in the context of industrialization and the first national level unions with membership from workers belonging to different industries, which were set up in England during this period. This period also saw the growth of trade unions in other industrializing countries, especially the United States, Germany and France. The trade union movement in India started with the formation of mill workers unions towards the end of the 19th century in Bombay and other associations soon after. Several leaders of the Indian national movement also associated themselves with and participated in the trade union movement. After the First World War and the Russian Revolution, the social and political consequences of industrialization and the transformation of societies and economies around the world became a key political issue. The demands from workers for decent wages and dignity became more urgent. During this period, Several countries around the world made laws capping the working day at 8 hours and creating mandatory unemployment insurance systems which were previously voluntary or based on membership in trade unions. Another important development happened in the sphere of international law. The International Labour Organization was established soon after the First World War with membership from national governments, employers and workers associations. Among its main achievements was the adoption of international standards called Conventions and Recommendations for implementation in member states. These conventions and recommendations contain guidelines on child labour, protection of women workers, hours of work, rest and holidays with pay, labour inspection, vocational guidance and training, social security protection, workers' housing, occupational health and safety, conditions of work at sea, and protection of migrant workers. They also cover questions of basic human rights, among them freedom of association, collective bargaining, the abolition of forced labour and the elimination of discrimination in employment. So far in this video, we have taken a quick look at the history between the Industrial Revolution and the Second World War of the role that law played in decent work. At the beginning of this period, the more prevalent view was that it was most important to not restrict the will of the employers and employees to enter into and to leave employment contracts. Through this period, however, there was greater recognition that these parties did not approach the negotiation of these contracts from evenly matched positions and that people's working lives cannot be governed by market forces alone. The fundamental motivation behind the emergence in law of labour standards and the protection of collective bargaining through trade unions was to protect the weaker party in the labour market during negotiations for salary and working conditions. The body of law that is known today as labour law or sometimes as industrial law retains some of these motives. Before we proceed further, let us first try to understand what labour law seeks to do. Firstly, it seeks to redress the imbalance in negotiating positions and make it less unequal by protecting the ability of employees to organize and bargain collectively to settle salaries and working conditions and to resolve disputes. Secondly, it seeks to prevent conditions of work from being pushed below levels that society feels acceptable by setting out minimum standards of wages, working time, health and safety standards, etc. While work continues to be governed by employment contracts between employers and employees and the rules instituted by employers and made applicable to different workplaces, the major sources of labour standards are often collective agreements between employers and trade unions, statutes made by legislatures and by administrative bodies, national constitutions and international standards set out in various international instruments such as ILO conventions. We will revisit all these sources in the second module of this course. In this video, we have learnt from a historical perspective the central motivations of labour law. By watching this video, we have taken the first steps in understanding how the instruments of law can make work in today's globalised supply chains more humane. In the next video, we will understand the role that trade unions and collective bargaining can play in making work more humane. Thank you for watching.